This is episode 18 with Mr. Sam Obitz. Welcome to the Sports Business Classroom audio experience. I'm your host, Sergio Millis, and each week I'll bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover how to break in and succeed in sports and life. Thanks for spending some time with me today and let the experience begin. This episode is brought to you by Sports Business Classroom 2020, an immersive sports business training and educational experience unlike any other, taking place July 12th through the 18th in Las Vegas during Summer League. Registration for the program opened last week, and ladies and gentlemen, you do not want to miss this. It truly is a -a one-of-a-kind learning opportunity for anyone interested in the business of basketball and jobs in sports in general. I mean, if you dream of one day landing a job in sports, are passionate about learning, or simply want to show the right people that you have what it takes to get a job in sports, this program is for you. Sports Business Classroom combines the best of all worlds into a single package. It's great academics, it's hands-on experience, it's immersion in the Las Vegas Summer League, and it's interaction with some of the best minds working in and around the NBA. You can check out all the details for the 2020 program at sportsbusinessclassroom.com. And if you're at all interested, make sure to apply as soon as possible as this program will fill up. Again, the URL is www.sportsbusinessclassroom.com. Please note that none of the information in this podcast is medical advice, and this podcast is intended for informational purposes only. Today's guest is Sam Ovitz, a peak performance specialist and author that works with athletes, executives, and both college and pro sports organizations. Sam is a brilliant guy, and I thought it would be timely to have him on the show, as here in the U.S., we're right in the middle of the COVID-19 epidemic. And I wanted to have Sam on to give some insights as far as how people can best deal with their fears and anxieties and continue to perform at a high level. Sam is a brilliant peak performance specialist and someone that I've turned to time and time again for advice on these very topics, dealing with uncertainty, dealing with unproductive thoughts, and working towards having the best frame of mind possible in order to achieve maximum success. In this episode, we discuss what it's like to work with professional athletes, the difference between being process and goal-oriented, and some little-known, super effective exercises people can do to work with unproductive thoughts. I truly cherish every moment that I get to spend with Sam and hope you get a lot out of this conversation. It is my most sincere hope that this conversation will help people in a time of need. Without further ado, I give you Mr. Sam opens. All right. Perfect. Well, Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. Good to hear your voice. It's good to hear yours. And, you know, the world is a crazy place right now. And, you know, when I was thinking about potential guests who could come on and talk about easing anxiety and helping people cope with, you know, all the craziness, you know, naturally I thought of you. So appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I'm happy to do it. I hope I can help at least one person. I hate that saying. I want to help more than one. You're going to help a bunch of people by being here. I'm I'm confident of it. So Sam, before we get into, you know, some different ways to cope with what's going on, tell us a little bit about what it is that you do for work and who you are. Okay. Uh, my name's Sam Obitz. Um, the short answer is uh, I specialize in helping good people make themselves better or hopefully great. Uh, Uh, And how I do that is through the mind and their mental outlook and many things associated with that and creating new habits. Mm -hmm. I work with a wide variety of people. Um, It used to be primarily college and professional athletes and college and professional teams. Uh, A few years ago, one of the people who referred NBA players to me started working with some kids that were younger than anyone I'd ever worked with and uh, asked me to take them on. And I took one of them on and really enjoyed that. So now I, 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 the youngest client I've ever worked with was 13. Mm-hmm. Um, I have since learned that there's a plenty of research that shows that the best time to teach a lot of the things that I teach is uh, around 14 to 14 and a half, which blew me away because prior to the 13 year old, 
I had never uh, taken on anyone under the age of 16. Um, and I work with not just athletes. Um, if you want the athlete side, uh, I started with uh, pro football, college and pro football initially, and that everything grew from there. I eventually started working with some pro and college golfers, um, some women's volleyball and soccer players. I started taking on coaches as clients for mostly major college, some professional, mm -hmm. uh, mostly football, some basketball. Um, I lean heavily. My client list leans heavily towards golf, basketball, and football um, when it comes to athletes. But I've had track. I've had swimming. I've had a multitude of women's soccer, women's volleyball. Um, you know, it applies to anything. It's just, you know, how you use it to apply to your sport. It works across all things. And outside of the sports world, um, early on, I, I got asked to speak to some uh, corporations. And I started to realize that a lot of this helps people get more out of their employees in a good way, not in a, you know, a... a what do I say in a, a, a hardcore way, not, not using and abusing, but helping them feel better about what they're doing and getting their mindset to a place where they become more productive. So I've consulted with law firms, um, startups, mm -hmm. biotech, um, you name it, uh, major corporations in telecom and computers. And I've worked through those things. Um, I've worked with people in uh, television. Uh, I've spoken to sports production teams. And a lot of the times when I speak to these teams, I started out working with uh, people with anxiety issues before I got into the high performance side. Mm -hmm. And as a result, when I would speak to these teams about how to get more out of their people or how to be more productive or have more oriented towards peak performance, you know, anxiety is a big part of all those things and reducing anxiety, especially. So that would be part of my overall talk. And I started to notice that people that I would normally think were the people that didn't need my help were the people that approached me after the talks. And I started working with a lot of them. And a, a lot of them were C-level employees at the highest level of the companies. And so I've had a lot of I've had CEOs, I've had billionaires, I, I have uh, people involved with ownership in pro sports, mm -hmm. people in, in general management in pro sports, a lot of coaches, as I said before. So it, it's my range of people. And I've, I've, I work with some people, usually referred to by other clients or friends. I pretty much work on a referral basis, although I do have an application process on my website that people can try to work with me. But the if I if I don't have a slot at the time, I rarely get into my wait list. But a lot of people come to me with just, you know, coping issues and life issues. And that's probably why you wanted me here today, because that that's a big part of everybody. But it it often comes in later with the athletes as I get to know them and get to see that they may have issues with it. It's not like what we start with. But I do have people that come to me that or having a hard time coping with life and, and or people that want to get off meds that have been on them for years. Yeah, no. And you know what? I mean, you and I have been friends for a long time and I've always been fascinated by how much knowledge you have about the mind, about the brain and about peak performance. Right. And, and that's really what this show is all about is achieving peak performance. So can you, before we get into different strategies, as far as how to cope with what's going on today, can you talk a little bit about your process as it relates to what it is that you do with the athletes? Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm going to be general for you because there's no one process. I, I, I kind of pride myself on treating every client I have as an individual. Now, of course, there's a lot of overlap. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you use the perfect word to start, uh, process. You know, a lot of people are result oriented and I've found that people that are result oriented are much less likely to get the results they're looking for than people that are process oriented. And what does that I, mean? Can you talk about what that means for somebody who might not understand that? Yeah. Um, result oriented um, are people that, you know, it's like you go to a driving range and 
if you've ever been to a golf driving range, everybody's hitting their woods or their driver. And they just want to hit the ball as far as they can because it feels good to hit a ball really far. You feel really good about yourself when you do. Mm -hmm. But most of golf is not the driver. It's the short game. So if you really want to get better, you'll have a process of working on all the clubs in your bag when you're on the driving range and learning how to hit them optimally. Mm -hmm. But most people would rather feel good about what they're doing rather than get better at what they're doing. So they're looking for that instant gratification when you're looking for results. Mm -hmm. You know, you go to, it's like when you work out. I mean, here's the difference. The work I do, there's a lot of writing and, and it's working your mind and you're building you know, just like you build muscle when you work out, you build new pathways in your brain that help you. And, and you know, just like the stronger you are, the easier it is to lift something. The more mentally strong you are, the easier it is to accomplish things or get through things that are difficult. But the difference is, you know, if you could have 10 sessions with me and, you know, you might go backwards before you get better, before you start seeing the results. You have to go through the process and, and, and change how you think about things before you're going to see any results. So you might get frustrated, you know, at session two and say, God, you know, I've gotten to two sessions. I feel no different. I feel worse than I felt. <laughs> now, if you're lifting weights, you know, let's say you're focusing on the chest and bicep, you know. You might see you might see your arms getting a little bigger and your chest getting a little bigger after just one workout, mm -hmm. and that's a result orientation. So there's a lot of trust involved. You know, you got to pick the right process. It's not like just picking a process is going to guarantee you results. But I like to think that you know I've honed my work to where I can find a process that works for anyone. Sure. And so can you speak to some of the tools that are in your toolkit as far as working with athletes go? Yeah. Um, you know, the first thing I have to do is find out where their problems lie. And there, God, there are so many different common ones. One is perfectionism. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my most one of my most common problems and one of the most common ones there are. So you're you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I, and I had it for a long time. It, it And perfectionism is kind of like a rainbow where it, it promise you promises you riches at the end of it. But the riches are never there that you're expecting to see when you get to the end of the rainbow. You just never get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about perfectionism, look around the room you're in right now. Is there anything in that room right now that's perfect? Zero. Anything? Zero. Yeah. I mean, or, you know, and, and perfectionism, you know, promises riches but delivers pain because you're never going to achieve it. And, and trying to achieve it, the, the problem with it is, when you're learning something new, trying to do things right or perfect can be really useful. But as you get good at something and become proficient at it, it goes the other way. It keeps you from being better because when you're trying to be perfect, you tighten up. Mm -hmm. And one thing I tell all my clients is no matter whether it's a CEO, a pro football player, a golfer, if you're trying to be perfect, you're not performing as well as you could be because you're tight. And all performance comes out of how loose you are. The more company, it's like riding a bike. You know, you don't think about it when you're riding a bike and you probably ride a bike pretty well. But the first time you got on it, you had to really think about it. And you were really herky jerky because you're tight because you're trying to do all these things. But that's the process of learning how to do something. And that's OK. Mm -hmm. But most people never let go of it. They think, hey, that's what I did to get here. This will take me there. And it'll actually take you the other direction once you've reached a certain level. So I have a couple of follow up questions to that. So how does perfectionism manifest itself? Let's start with athletes and then I want to move on to CEOs. Well, they, I'll give you an example with an athlete that I had early on in my career. He was a pro football wide receiver. And it's funny because most pro athletes have big egos because they're surrounded by people who love them and want to be them. And I don't really like pro sports that much. So I don't watch a lot of pro sports. I'll watch some and I like following my players occasionally, but I'm not, I've never been a big pro sports fan. Well, when I was a child, I was, I take that back. But since I've become an adult, I've not been a big pro sports fan. So the first thing they say to me is, did you see my game? 
And the answer, they most of them don't <laughs> believe me when I say I don't watch games because they're surrounded by people that do. Mm -hmm. And I always say you become the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So they're around people that always want to see their games. So they can't believe I'm serious when I say, no, I don't watch many games. So that we get past that barrier. And then I ask them, okay, now tell me how your game went. And I, I'll never forget this one wide right receiver who's just a great guy all around, had had bright, athletic, hardworking, everything you want in an athlete, good looking guy. And uh, I go, how was your game? He goes, horrible. And I said, well, tell me about that. What does that mean? He goes, I only caught one pass. And I go, why was it horrible? And he goes, I just told you, I only caught one pass. I go, well, how'd you do on your blocking assignments? He goes, I didn't miss any. I was on point. That's great. I go, how many times was the ball thrown to you? He said, twice. I go, so you caught 50% of the balls. Too. Why didn't you catch the one that got to you? He goes, he overthrew me. So the only one you were capable of catching, you caught. You did as well as you could possibly do. Why did you say the game was horrible? To me, that's a good game. I go, tell me this. How was your route running? Well, one thing you got to know about receivers, they're always open. So, of course, he said, <laughs> he goes, you know, I, I was open every play. You know, I, I ran great routes. I go, well, then you did everything you were paid to do. You ran great routes. You caught the ball that was catchable that came to you, and you hit all your blocking assignments. To me, that's as good of a game as it could have been. Why did you say it was horrible? And he kind of paused. He goes, well, I never looked at it that way. And I go, well, how does that help you by thinking it's horrible? You know, why are you trying to be perfect? Why do you... It, every game, you're not going to catch 12 balls. Every game, you know, but the game you catch 12 balls, you might miss half of your blocks. So maybe that game wasn't that good. Sure. You know, you're you're judging yourself against a meter that's not realistic. Right. No, and I think that's a common problem. Uh, I mean, all across society right now. And that's that also overlaps with what we talked about with results and process. His process was great that game. He made all his blocks, according to him, open every play. I question that, but in his mind, he was. But he, you know, basically did what he was supposed to do. And that's process. And if he does that every game, I told him, I guarantee you're going to have games where you catch 10 passes if you just keep doing what you did in this game. But if you look at that as that as a horrible game, now you're focused on results again. And you're like, well, you know, the game I got 10 passes, I played great. The game I caught one pass. And I said, that's not necessarily true. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I had one of my top high school kids who's got a very bright future, has a coach who I don't believe uses him properly. And he sat him down. And he said, you know, the numbers don't lie. And I'm like, the numbers absolutely lie because I was at the game and he was doing everything he was supposed to do. But, you know, you can't make 10 shots when you only touch the ball five times in a game, that's just not physically possible. Right. So, you know, a lot of people get caught up in things that don't matter and miss the things that do matter. Why do people do that? Habit. You know, we, we, we learn a lot of things early in life. And the problem is, and, and this applies not just to performance, but to anxiety as well. This is kind of the secret of why a lot of our, a lot of our anxiety comes from hidden beliefs that we don't even know we have that happened when we were in our formative years. Mm -hmm. I, I often in my talks use a story about imagine a kid who loves to ride, go down slides. That's his favorite thing to do on the playground. And we'll say for the sake of example, we'll say he's five years old and his class goes to a park that has a slide that's three times bigger than any slide he's ever been on. And he looks at it, and he's intimidated. He's a little scared. Mm -hmm. So he does what any kid in that situation would do is he decides I'm going to play on the swings today. Well, everybody knows, and we'll, we'll say the, name, the kid's name's Johnny. Well, everybody starts to, eventually kids are going to notice, hey, Johnny's not on the slide. Johnny's always on the slide. And one of the kids will yell, hey, Johnny, Come on, you got to try this slide. It's awesome. It's the best slide ever. He's like, no, that's cool. I'm, I'm having fun on the swings today. I I'm good. And then what happens? All the kids are like, hey, hey, everybody, Johnny's afraid of the slide. 
Hey, Johnny, Johnny's a scaredy cat. Johnny's a scaredy cat. And what happens is just from that one time, when a group of your peers at that age of your formative years or an adult, a, a, an authority figure, your teacher, your parent, a relative says something, they don't have the ability to question whether it's true or not. It, if everybody's saying it, it must be true. If an adult's saying it to me that is in an, an authority position, it must be true because they haven't grown old enough to have a perspective where they can say, you know, I disagree with you or you're full of it. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. Like you and I could say, if, I, if you and I went to a park and you were afraid of the slide or were on the swings, I'd say, hey, Sergio, you're a scaredy cat. You'd say, screw you. <laughs> you know, right, right. your own business, Right. They don't have that ability. So now, and it only takes one time, and this is what's hard for people to grasp, that one event plants like a computer program you put on your phone, an app on your phone, or a computer program on your computer, gets planted in Johnny. Johnny now has a belief that I'm a scaredy cat. And the reality of life is, no matter who you are and how big and strong you are or whatever, everyone's afraid of something. So, you know, some people are afraid of needles. Some people are afraid of spiders. It doesn't matter, you know, but we're all afraid of something. Sure. But here, once that program's planted on you, and here in Johnny's case, it's I'm a scaredy cat. Every time he runs, let's just for the sake of example, we'll use the two examples I just used, needles and spiders. Every time he sees a spider and gets scared or, or has to get a shot and gets scared, he, it reinforces, I'm a scaredy cat. What he does is a thing I call the binocular trick, a reverse binocular. He takes that and looks at that with the binoculars really up close. And when you look at something with binoculars up close, it, it appears huge, right? It gets expanded. Mm -hmm. So everything that reinforces that belief that was planted on that he's a scaredy cat seems 10 times bigger than it really is, right? It's like making a mountain out of a molehill. Sure. So now that's what happens every time he has, has he's scared. It, it just reinforces and it makes that belief stronger. And this just proves they were right. I am a scaredy cat and it blows it way out of proportion. Now, what most people in that situation do, if they even become aware that people think they're a scaredy cat or, or that they feel like they're a scaredy cat, the way they try and combat that is, well, I'm going to go skydiving or I'm going to go hang glide, or I'm going to go cliff dive, whatever it is, to try and prove to themselves that they're not a scaredy cat. The problem, now that logically makes sense, right? Do you buy sure. into that? Absolutely. And you and I wouldn't call someone who does those things a scaredy cat, right? No, oh no. But the problem is the way it is planted in the program in his mind does just the opposite of what he does with the binoculars when he does skydiving or cliff diving or hang gliding. He turns the binoculars around and looks at it through the wrong way. And what happens when you look through binoculars the wrong way? Everything becomes tiny. Mm -hmm. It gets reduced. So essentially, one time of being scared of a spider would probably take 100 skydiving trips to equal wow. in, in your mind. So you're, 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 you're basically stuck in a losing proposition and you don't know that you are. So what you do is you keep trying to do these different daredevil things, but you know, it's hard to get to a hundred and that's just for one spider fearful episode. Yeah. And this is such an important topic, Sam. We could, t we could talk about this for the next two hours <laughs> because the truth of the matter is I think most people may potentially be hearing this for the first time, right? That they've been conditioned by their thoughts and their, like you said, their, their, their software running in their head that was programmed when they were a kid before they could even evaluate whether or not those things were even true. So definitely encourage everybody who's listening to, you know, really take that to heart and, and, you know, maybe you can provide some exercises, Sam, that people can do to try and combat these things or even work through these problems, but at least be cognizant of the fact that a lot of the things that you fear 
weren't aren't necessarily reality that a lot of it was just programming based on things that happened to you as a kid and i think that even just being cognizant of that really starts to take you down a path where you know you can start performing at a higher level and living a more fulfilled life there are a couple things i consider myself good at and that's what i already said helping pe good people make themselves better or great mm -hmm. and pissing people off yep and the reason I say pissing people off is, you know, a lot of my work revolves around telling people things they don't want to hear. And, you know, you have to come to me with a certain amount of trust. Maybe that's why it works so well with referrals for me, um, because I'm going to say some things that are probably uncomfortable for you to hear. And, you know, it's uncomfortable. People don't like to change it. And, you know, the younger you are, the easier it is to change. You know, I find that, and I, I'm using a, a very generalized number, but once people hit around the age of 30, mm -hmm. they just want to coast on what they already have. And they don't really want to be challenged. The average person will defend whatever they do to as hard as they can, rather than take a little less energy to change. And the example that I want to give is, um, I like to challenge things. I like to be challenged. I One thing that differs my speeches from others is the start of my speeches generally include something along the lines of, if I say something that doesn't make sense to you or you disagree with, I want you to interrupt me. I want to be challenged because I might learn something new. Most people want to get through their speech and go home and collect their check. Mm-hmm. And that's the mindset of the average person is, I just want to get by. I just want to get through this. I want to get better because I find that I'm happier, more engaged with life. And, you know, I mean, how you approach someone, you, you don't tell somebody, wow, you're really screwing that up. That's nobody. I don't adapt well to that initially. You know, you, you have to approach them with, you know, hey, I noticed that you were doing this this way. Have you ever thought about it this way or would you could be open to considering another way of doing that when you approach people? But that's when well, we deal with our spouses or our kids or whatever. We jump on them. Oh, you screwed that up. Or, oh, God, you're an idiot. I mean, and, and nobody hears those words and says, wow, I really want to improve myself. So language is very hard as well. So the example I was talking about is I like to try things. I like to test myself. I'm always trying something new. Mm -hmm. Now, not everything works. I mean, the current thing I'm trying, um, I've been trying for a while and I'm not sold on it yet. Um, it's I, I'm drinking hydrogen water. It's okay. very popular in Japan. They make all sorts of claims about it. I, I the only thing I've noticed for sure is I was on a trip and I broke my machine that makes the water. It was it's glass. And I wasn't able to drink it for three days. And the second day, I started getting headaches. So I know it's doing something. I just don't know if it's anything of benefit. Right. But anyhow, I'm willing to do it. So most people don't want to try something new. And here's why. And it's kind of like those old messages that we talked about that are planted on you when you're young. So there's an old story about four gorillas in a cage. Mm -hmm. And every day at noon, the handler would come and bring a big stack of bananas, open the top of the cage and put it in there for them to eat, hang it up from the top. Well, on this one particular day, before lunchtime, they moved one of the gorillas out of the cage and they put a new gorilla in that had never been in there before. And so they wait and all of a sudden it's noon and the guy comes, he puts the bananas in and the new guy in the cage goes and goes full speed at the bananas. And as soon as he gets there, the other three bananas just beat the crap out of him. And he's just like shocked and just kind of reveres back. And everybody goes about their business. And then the next day, they take out another one of the original four. And they put another new guy in. And that new guy, when the bananas come in, goes right for the bananas. And the other three beat the crap out of him, just like the day before. Mm -hmm. The next day... They take out a third one of the original four and they put another new guy in. You know what happens. Bananas come in. He goes, gets beat up. So now they're on the last original guy and they take him out. 
and they put another guy in, another new guy, four days in a row now. Noon comes, bananas go in, new guy goes for the bananas, other three guys start pummeling him, and he looks at him and goes, what the heck is that for? And they look at each other with kind of confused looks on their face, and they just look at him and they say, well, that's how we do things here. That's how we've always done things here. Right. And that's kind of the average mindset. You don't get peak performance out of that, doing what's average. Nobody says, I want to be, I want to be average. People want to be great. You got to do things other people don't do if you want to be great. So I'll give you an example of one of the places um, I get a lot of resistance from my athletes. Okay. And 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 my daughter even would apply to this one. So almost any athlete is going to have a sprained ankle, uh, an injured muscle, some kind of minor injury at some point. Will you agree with me on that? Yep, absolutely. And it's part of um, life. And I'm going to set myself up for failure here by asking you a question I don't know the answer to. But let's say you sprain your ankle. What's usually the first thing they want you to do? They want you to ice it. Exactly. And, you know, we've done icing forever. And it's like the bananas. That's how we do things here. That's how we've always done things. But all the recent research shows icing is, if anything, counterproductive. It causes more harm than good. The one thing icing is good for is to relieve pain, but I would only use that to relieve pain if all other options are exhausted and the pain's extreme. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, I don't ever use ice for that purpose. Ice, it you know, we're always told that oh, it'll stop the the swelling, and they're right, it does do that, but that's not a good thing. Our body is built for survival. We're built to survive. Everything we do is big. That causes a lot of anxiety, too, because a lot of the things I teach my guys go against survival. And we're naturally prone to that. We've been evolved over years to survive. So you can imagine the resistance I get when I tell them to do something that goes against a survival instinct that's built into their code. Sure. That's so with ice, so with, go ahead if you had a question there. No, no, no. Go ahead, okay. please. So what I tell them is, you know, your body is built to survive and it's swelling up for a reason that that's there to, to help you recover. And so, I mean, I'll give you an example for my daughter used to hate it because as soon as she'd have an injury, her coaches would be on her. You got his ice. And she's like, my dad's going to get mad at me. <laughs> you know, seven. And, and, you know, you hear it every day. She, she started to doubt me, you know, and I don't blame her. It's, you, these things that are so overpowering because everybody does them. But, you know, pe think of the people you think are exceptional or great. Do you ever say, wow, they do just like they do the same things everyone else does. Right. Do, do you ever say that? No. The people that are exceptional do the things that everybody else don't it's do. Too, yeah, it's too lazy or unwilling to do. Sure. Absolutely. So, so anyhow – you know, I got a lot of resistance from her on that. You know, it, it, it took a while for her to come around and realize that, wow, dad isn't as dumb as I think he is, <laughs> which, you know, is only right in that area, <laughs> probably. But anyhow, um, so it's hard to go against a survival state. I'll give you an exa a personal example for me. Um, I was fortunate that one of my pro athletes um, had tried – something on an injury that I had never heard of. So I got exposure to something I'd never heard of and not widely accepted. Um, this was about 10 years ago. Now he was uh, a pro football player and he had a tear in his rotator cuff mm -hmm. and the tear happened in June and they told him he had to have surgery and he'd be out for the season. And he didn't want to miss the season and he was depressed and down. And he found out through one of his friends he went to college with that there was a procedure called prolotherapy. And prolotherapy is pretty much the opposite of ice. You inject sugar water into the inflamed area to cause increased blood flow to hopefully repair it. 
-hmm. and it causes inflammation. And he had this procedure done and he was told he would be out for the season. And he, he was actually back practicing before preseason ended and started playing four weeks into the season and, and, and played six more years after that and never had surgery. Wow. Now there, there are things you have to be a good candidate for this procedure, prolotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, if you've had a surgery in the area before, the scar tissue will keep it from working. So it won't work on anyone who's had a previous surgery in the area. And it doesn't work for everyone. So it's, you know, he took a risk, but his risk was he was already going to miss the season. If this doesn't work, I'll have surgery. Well, serendipity is my favorite word. And so this happened. And then about seven years ago, I had a, my, I like to surf and I was having a hard time surfing more than a couple times a week because I was having issues with my right shoulder. So, uh, with the memory of him in mind, I, I, I called him up and asked him, who's the guy who did your prolo therapy? And unfortunately, not so serendipitously, the guy who had done his had died. So he didn't really have a new guy. So I had to start searching. And there were a lot of people who did it who are less than scrupulous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. And but I I I read some articles on one guy and I liked what I saw. And he was kind of out of the mainstream, didn't deal with athletes, and it wasn't his main focus, but I, I the stuff he had written was appealing to me. So I decided to go meet with him. I mean, the guy's a friend of mine to this day. The guy was brilliant. Um, he, he even gave me a discount. I mean, I just, it was just, we just hit it off. And I had, I think, five treatments. And within two months, I was back surfing and I haven't had any issue with my shoulder since. And I was told I was going to have to have surgery. Wow. No, it just goes to show you that what's popular. And what's, and I say in air quotes, common knowledge isn't always necessarily the best route forward, right? And, and I encourage everybody who's listening to, you know, just, just be more inquisitive and be, you know, ask more questions as far as what it is you're doing and the advice you're given. Because a lot of times, like Sam said, you know, you're told to, you know, put ice on an ankle sprain and that may not be the best case scenario. So it's, it's, I think the more curious you are as far as all of the possibilities to fix a problem or to get better or to try to achieve peak performance or whatever it is that you're trying to do, I think the better off you are. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, some of the things do work, but not everything. My thing is I like your be inquisitive. I mean, I don't know where I got some of the habits I got because I had a lot of bad ones, but I had some really good ones that served me well. And one, one of the biggest compliments I ever got was from my best friend in college because he was working in Alaska in the summer to make a bunch of money in a little town called Bethel, Alaska, which was the middle of nowhere. And they, during the summer while he was there, they had cut most airline service from there. And it was like super expensive to fly home. So he was going to lose half his summer savings just to fly home. And he said, I learned from you, don't take no for an answer. Keep mm -hmm. pushing till you get an answer that works for you. And he goes, so I was thinking, what would, what would my buddy Sam do? And he was able to get he and all his friends home. I think the flight was going to cost like 2,500 bucks to get home to LA. And it cost each one of the guys $600 because what they did was they asked around, how does this stuff get in? How's this? And they got on a cargo flight out. There you go. Solving problems. Yeah. So, I mean, there's always a way. It just hasn't been figured out yet. But people, this goes back to what I told you about people in turning 30, even though that's a random number. It seems to be a, a good one to use. They just want to coast and do what they always have done. Right. And it's the people that, you know, most people would have just said, oh, shoot, I, I, I'm going to have to spend half my savings to get home. And I didn't really put away the money I thought I would. 
But he didn't accept that. He's like, no, there's got to be another way. And, you know, it's kind of like Thomas Edison said, you know, you know, it, most people give up right before they're about to have that breakthrough. Sure. And, and I agree. So I, wa I want to shift gears a little bit here, Sam, uh, you know, going back to the current state of the world, right? The yep. COVID-19 has really disrupted life as we know it. Um uh, I'm just curious, you know, you, you've probably got a lot of clients, you know, athletes, CEOs who are sitting at home right now, who are probably, probably fearful, probably a little bit of anxious and just uncertain of what's going to come. I'm curious, what are, what are some of the ways that you're working with people right now to help them cope with, you know, what, what seems to be the new normal at this point? Yeah. The, the first thing. Uh, the first mistake that I see most people making is obsessing over it, paying too much attention to social media, paying too much attention to the news or whatever's going on. I mean, come on. The odds of anything that happens today affecting you individually in, in, in any immediacy is zero. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, if if the the things if, if you check in, I mean, I say at most check in once a day on what's going on. If you check in once a day, that's that's more than enough to get you up to date on what's going on. I mean, you're falling into a trap of average when you obsess over this stuff. Yeah. You know, it's the people that are taking advantage of like, hey, now's the time I can do some of those things I've been wanting to do to better myself that I've never had time for. You know, what can I do now so when this, you know, eventually this is going to end and when it does, the people that have used their time instead of being obsessed and worried and and focused on, oh, what now, what now, all oh, this, you know, are the people that are going to win in the long run. Also, you know, there's plenty of evidence that, you know, people that are optimistic live longer lives, are healthier and have stronger immune systems than people who are pessimistic and negative. So it's hard not to be negative. You know, when you're looking at the news and the numbers are going up and things are closing and things are being shut down and all those things. So you're actually harming your immune system when you think you're helping yourself by keeping track of everything. You're actually lowering the one thing you need right now in case you do get it. Right. And, and to that point, Sam, you know, I've have traditionally been very, very good about trying to stay away from the news because, you know, similar to you, I know that it it causes anxiety. But since this whole thing has come about, I've been checking the news every day I, and four or five times a day and more than I'd like to admit. And 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 you're absolutely right. But the point that I want to make is that. I still check the news, even though I'm perfectly cognizant of the fact that it's making me more anxious and more fearful and sadder about the current situation. So do, do you have any tips or tricks as far as how to how to stay away from that stuff? Little things add up to big things. You know, you got to start small, you know. Just start to organize. You know, it's it's like, are you familiar with the Ulysses contract? I'm not, no. Okay. Ulysses contract is very similar. It's a shortcut to having a process. Uh, the, the story goes for how the Ulysses contract, what it is, is you're making a deal with yourself. You know, like if if all of a sudden three big guys come up behind you and are about to jump you, that's the wrong time to come up with how you're going to deal with it. Sure. But if you have a plan for, hey, if three guys, if like right now while you and I are talking, if you and I, and I develop a plan for dealing with that situation, mm -hmm. it will be much better prepared once we're in that situation to do it. Maybe we even know how to avoid it completely, right? Sure. But if you wait till you're in the situation, that's the worst time to start making decisions. So a Ulysses contract is decisions you make now to help you in a time you know that's going to be hard to make a decision. So an example of that would be, you know, um, 
I'm only going to watch the, you know, pick your hour, 11 o'clock news. That's the only news I'm going to watch today. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to have it that you have that decision made ahead of time. Otherwise, it's like, oh, what did I just hear? Did they say they're closing down schools? Oh, I need to turn on the news. You know, just no, I'll find out at 11. So how a Ulysses contract came about was the story goes there was were ships that would go by this island. And this island had the most beautiful maidens with the most beautiful voices. And every time they would, the ships would go by, the maidens would start to sing. And it was so alluring, the ships would go dock at that port and they'd get robbed. So now a Ulysses contract was, okay, we know that they have those beautiful maidens with the softest voices on the planet that we can't resist. So now the captain ties everyone to the mast as they go by that mm -hmm. part of the, you know, those islands and then unties them when they're passed. They've so got that a was a just, yeah, the, the decision was made ahead. So what a Ulysses contract is, is you make these decisions before you're in the situation because you know, you're not going to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I think that's so. Right. So, and that applies to everything. And it's also, it's a process orientation. So I would say start small, you know, because it's hard to say, you know, if you were to say, you know, Sam, I check uh, social media 25 times a day and I watch the news, you know, off and on probably 10 times a day. If I say, OK, you need to stop that. What are the odds that it's, you're going to be able to do that? Sure. Not good. Not yeah. Good. Pretty close to zero. Mm -hmm. But if I say, well, let's let's just start putting some things in place. You know, how about if you check? you know, once an hour? How about if you watch the news three times a day? You know, that, to me, that sounds doable. Maybe it's not doable to you. Everybody's different. But you got to start with something. And then as you get comfortable with that, you start to realize, wow, I feel better and I'm still getting all the same news. I'm just not hearing it 10 times. Right. Now maybe you'll say, okay, maybe I'll go down to one time a day on the news and five times a day on social media. Do you have any thoughts on how to make something like that stick? Like, is this something that you write down? Is this, you know, what, what, what is the best way to make sure that something like this sticks and that you're actually able to follow through on it? Well, you know, I hate things like the best way, mm -hmm. you know, there is no, everybody's different. You know, I, I, that's why I do different things with different athletes. You know, I have some things that work great for some athletes that don't work at all for others. Mm -hmm. You know, I gotta, you gotta know yourself or I have to know you if you're someone I'm working with before I can give you the quote unquote best advice. And it might involve a lot of trial and error. So I encourage you to try things. The best thing is, you know, some people work well with, you know, written lists, have a list, watch the news uh, less than three times and then check that off. Some people are really motivated by checklists. You know, that could be one person. Some people might say there's no way I'm doing that, which is fine. That doesn't work for them. You know, other things are just, you know, the busier you are, the more, you know, people hate structure. People think that the secret to happiness is more free time. You know, I, I'm not, I, I, I'll take something from, you know, religion. An idle mind is the devil's workshop. Most, one of the hardest things most of my athletes do is retire mm -hmm. or, or have their career end unexpectedly because, they have visions of, oh, God, life's going to be great. I don't have to go work out every day. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. I don't have to be at that team meeting, whatever it is. The reality is what, what, what reality for a pro athlete when it ends is most are married by that time and they have kids. The wife has a different mindset than you have. Their mindset is, okay, I've been doing everything for the last 10 years. Now you're going to take the kids to their appointments. Now you're going to do this. Right. And, and it, it's a shock to the system. A lot of marriages end because of that. Because these guys had this, oh, I got this easy life. And they tend to get depressed. I mean, pro sports, that's one of the, the things that never gets talked about is the amount of depression there is in pro sports, especially at the end of the, when the career ends. And I don't think enough's done beforehand to deal with that personally. No, and like you said, it's a shock to the system, right? Which I think yeah. is really 
what we're dealing with a similar shock right now, right? Everybody's been told, you know, or a lot of people have been told that they must stay home. A lot of students have been told that they can't go back to school, right? A lot of athletes have been told that, you know, the, the games or competitions that they were set to compete in are now not going to happen. So you're saying that more structure is better as far as coping with this from a mental standpoint? Yeah. You know, structure is very freeing and a process is even better. That's, you know, that's putting, you know, that's putting your structure to the next level when you have a process. Now, I mean, my process has changed because all my speaking engagements got canceled. <laughs> so I can't travel. So, you know, I have to fill that time and, you know, I can do it making myself better. I can do it, you know, taking care of issues. I mean, my back feels better than it's ever felt because I've got a, a workout I do for my back that I know makes me feel better, but I've often skip. Mm -hmm. And now I've, you know, one of the best advice I give is attach things to other things you do. You know, most people brush their teeth every day, attach something to do right after you brush your teeth mm -hmm. and then attach something to that. And that's how you start to get structure and a plan that works for you. So now I, after I do my normal morning routine, now I do this back workout and my back feels the best it's felt in years. Mm hmm. But I wouldn't have other. So I'm doing things that improve my life now to make up for what's take, been taken away. And, you know, here's the thing. Most people, you know, this is the wanting to feel better versus get better. Most people fall into that trap. And talking about how awful things are feels good. Talking about how much you hate, how you can't go. I, you know, if I were to just be sitting here saying, oh, God, Sergio life sucks now. I can't go to, I've, I've lost all this money. I can't go to these speaking engagements. You know, that feels good to vent, mm -hmm. but in the end, it, it actually takes me down. It doesn't help me. It's not productive. Right. I'm big on production. One thing we do is we personalize everything. Mm -hmm. And when you personalize things, it's much harder to get past them. You know, it's like there was a, a headline today. Um, Michael Phelps, you know, was, uh, you know, here, he's this guy who, you know, is now promoting all this mental health stuff and, and good for him for doing that. But, you know, because of his stature as a well-known successful athlete, you know, his voice gets magnified a little too much because he said something, the headline of the article was like exactly opposite. I mean, in, during the article, he said, you know, hey, it's a big time for mental health and it's more important now than ever. And I don't disagree with him. I don't know more important now than ever, more, more apparent now than ever. I don't think it's any more important. Sure. See, right there, he's overemphasizing. And these are the things that make you anxious. He's doing what he's telling you not to do by saying it's no, never more important than now. I'm like, no, it's always been important. It's just more heightened. Sure. And that's a problem, that, which could be turned to a good thing, which is what I like to do. The start of the article was Michael Phelps frustrated it took so long to postpone the Olympics. I, I just don't find frustration as a productive emotion. I mean, Sergio, can you give me the three times, just give me the three best times or most helpful times you were frustrated? Can't do it. Exactly. That's the point. So, you know... Why are you frustrated? It happened. Now let's deal with what happened. You know, I always like to say, and it alleviates a lot of anxiety is, um, regardless of what happens, I'll be able to deal with it effectively. So, okay, they finally postponed it. Great. Now, how can I deal with that effectively? And that's what you need. That's the mindset you have to have. Not, oh, I'm frustrated it took them this long. That just takes you backwards. You want to move forward with your life if you're like me. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like a lot of people are, are, are focused on things that they don't control at this point? Yes. You know, we have no control over how this is going to play out. So why are we obsessing over it? Why not focus on what we do control, what I can do to help myself and my family, what I can do to improve my situation or be ready to take advantage of the new opportunities that will be out there once it ends? Sure. I mean, it's so, certainly the more productive mindset. I'm, I'm curious as to how. So let's just say somebody's sitting sitting at home and listening to this, right? And and they they 
they come to the realization that they've been, you know, pulled into the current here, right? They're checking the news all the time. They're pessimistic. What are some of the things that you suggest that they do so that they can start working on the things that they do control? Well, you know, think about it. What is in your chart? What can you do today? I mean, just the average person. You can probably do some sort of exercise, whether it's through a YouTube video or going outside and staying away from people. But you can get some kind of exercise. And, and most people would agree with me that exercise is good, not just for physical health, but mental health. Mm -hmm. So there's one, one simple thing. Um, but it all boils down to creating new habits. You know, we all have habits. Some are good, some are bad. Why not? You know, it's not just about creating. We always talk about, oh, you know, I'm going to make exercise a habit. You know, that's the biggest New Year's resolution. And, you know, what happens every year? You know, by Valentine's Day, nobody's doing it. So, but one thing people don't talk about is getting rid of bad habits is probably more productive than starting new good habits. Sure. So why not try doing both at the same time? Hey, you know, uh, every time I have my morning coffee, I eat a, a really buttery muffin. Well, why don't I replace that buttery muffin with an apple? So I'm getting rid of the bad habit. I mean, I had a, a client who had a bit of a weight issue. This was a business CEO. And he would always, in the afternoon, go down and get a snack and get cookies uh, just to get him through the end of the day. In their, they had a cafeteria on his head, world headquarters. And I started to talk. I go, well, why do you do that? Because, well, I just need that energy and stuff. I go, well, you know, instead of cookies, why not a piece of fruit? And, and it turned out that he didn't even need the food. What he really wanted was a distraction. And he liked he'd always have a short conversation with the guy who ran the, the check cash register. Mm -hmm. So eventually, by changing it to an apple, he got to the point where he realized, I don't really need food at that point at all. I just need a diversion. And he started going for walks. Yep. And, and his life changed just with those little tiny changes. You know, it gave him time to reflect. It gave him time to let everything he was doing kind of – because, you know, I always say we use our conscious minds and think it's in control, but it's our subconscious that determines what happens to us. And when you create habits, you turn it over to your subconscious. Your subconscious mind is like a supercomputer. Your conscious mind is like a small post-it note. So if you have two tasks, if you have a task today, if I have you, you know, adding up all these numbers, are you going to use a calculator or the calculator app on your phone? Or are you going to use a piece of paper and write it all down on that piece of paper and do it? I'm using the supercomputer. And, and most people live their lives using the piece of paper, whether they know it or not. And that's their conscious mind. Mm -hmm. Our subconscious mind controls. And the way you, you know, I always tell my clients, what we're doing is teaching your mind, teaching you how to create habits where you use your mind, because otherwise your mind's going to use your you and your mind is basically lazy. Your mind is always going to choose the easy option. And that's why like a Ulysses contract, it supersedes your mind's natural way of working. It makes you take the harder, better choice. And that can become a habit. Once you create these habits, they work automatically. I mean, I'm shocked at, at how unbothered by everything that's going on I am. I mean, I'm, I've been... I've been investing in the stock market the, and I've been, I've been finding myself getting mad on the day it goes, days it goes up because I can't invest. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's all about your mindset. It's not about what's happening. Yeah. No, it's, it's all about perspective, right? You know, I noticed on your email to me, your sign off used a famous saying that I use all the time and that's life's 10% what happens and 90% how you react to it. And I couldn't agree more. But the problem is most people spend 99% of their time on the things that, you know, are out of their control or don't matter. Mm -hmm. and, and, and worrying about those things rather than staying on the 10% and, and taking some actions. 
So let's talk about the the uh, spending time on energy that on stuff that's beyond their control. Do you recommend like as an exercise that people sit down and list out all of the things that they're they're worried about that are out of their control or what 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 exercise if any would you recommend so that you know people can sit down and really start to evaluate the thoughts that they're having in their head that are causing them fear and anxiety? There, there are several. Um, unfortunately, some of them are, you know, a little more detailed and, and, and would be hard to get through, but I'll give you just at least some, some simple hints on them. I mean, writing in general is good. Uh, my clients um, don't like that I do a lot of writing. Most people that do what I do don't, don't incorporate a lot of writing, but through certain types of writing, you can change the pathways in your brain. So your default mechanisms get overshadowed by these new mechanisms. Now, there's a caveat there. Your old ways of thinking never completely leave. Those pathways are in your brain, but it's like a path that doesn't get used. Mm -hmm. Brush starts to grow over it. So you're less likely to go down that path if it's covered with brush, right? Sure. We like to take the clean, clear paths whenever we can. Now, you create these new clean, clear paths, and those will be the ones, once they become your new way of thinking, that you automatically use, except in times of unexpected extreme stress, you'll tend to go back to your old ones. Mm -hmm. But the difference is you won't get as locked into them as you were, and you won't stay there as long, and you'll be able to get out of them much quicker with the new pathways available. Got it. And so writing. So what's what's the writing now, exercise look like? Well, well, the key exercise I use is is going to be hard to give you the full thing, but I'll give you the, the overview. Mm-hmm. It's it's called a T form. Um, it's used for overcoming anxiety, and it's you know it's considered more effective than than antidepressants and anti anxiety drugs for the people who take to them and use them. Mm-hmm. That's the key. Most people don't. Um, I have the guy who taught me the basis for what I created as a T form, uh, tell me, I, I, I said, it's based in cognitive behavioral therapy. And he told me, uh, somewhat off the record, I, when, once I had gotten better because I had tremendous issues with anxiety and depression and panic disorder, and he helped me get better. And when I met with him after we were all done and, and my life had completely turned around and I said, you know, when you told us when we started this, you said it was 85% effective. I can't believe this one worked for anyone. And he goes, the only reason it's 85% effective is because there's a percentage of people that don't do it. And those, they give up before they give it a full try. And I'd say it's 99% effective. And it's based on learning to think more objectively. Okay. And all the T-form written exercise is, is... We have these automatic thoughts that we aren't even aware of. It takes time to get to the deeper ones, but we have some that we are aware of and you start with those. Can I give you uh, one? Can I give you one and can we do this? Yes. Okay. Let's see. Actually, let me just tell you what the T form looks like and then give it to me just so they have an idea of what we're going into. Perfect. So the T part of the T form is the thought, which Sergio is going to give me in a minute. The E part is an error and All upsetting thoughts that cause tightness, anxiety, depression, stress have errors in them. And there, I I list 10 common thinking errors, and you would list those errors in that spot. And then the A part of the T form is the analysis or answer. And this is where you talk back to the thought, and this is where the objective thought replaces the thought which tend to be more emotionally based than objection, uh, objectively based. Got it. Now I'm ready. Okay. So I'm sure one of the errors in thinking that is going through a lot of people's head that has, it, it happens to me is things are not going to get better anytime soon. And all of my plans are ruined. Okay. That's, you can't have more than one thought because you got to, you, you want to be direct in your counter so uh, how about that second one? That was pretty uh, intense. My plans all, are ruined. 
My plans are ruined. Okay, let's look at this objectively. Let me give you some errors. I might not get them all because I'm just going off the top of my head. But immediately you're jumping to a conclusion. That's one of the errors. Okay. Right? I mean, there's you unless you haven't told me about it, and I'd be really pissed at you because of our friendship if you haven't, but you don't own a crystal ball that works, do you? Not that I know of. Okay. So is it fair to say that neither you or I know that that's true? Yes, it is. Okay, so you jump to a conclusion that is highly unlikely if we're being objective. Um, it's also another error, extreme thinking. Extreme thinking is where you think everything's either good or bad. It's like there's no gray. Everything's black or white. And you said, all of my plans have been ruined. Well, what are the odds that every single plan you have are ruined? Very, very low. Now, if you it would be much harder to counter that thought if you said, a lot of my plans are ruined. Well, that's possible. But all of them, I find that highly unlikely. You're just extreme thinking, which is making you more upset. Mm -hmm. um, you're also blowing things out of proportion, you know, which is kind of the binocular trick. You're putting all the attention on what's bad and not on what's good. Sure. You know, I mean, I, I'm going to be a, a little flippant here in saying that, you know, Maybe all your plans were the worst plans for you and were destructive for you. And if they all are ruined, it was the, will become the best thing that ever happened to you. Which many times becomes the case. Yeah. Now, I could go through more errors on that, but let's stop there. That's plenty. Now we want to counter that thought. All my plans are ruined. I would say, really? How do I know that? You know, certainly some of them, are, are going to be changed or different and may not happen, but the odds of all of my plans being different are highly remote. Mm -hmm. It's likely that things will get better before I expect, and some of these things may even be in a better place, at, for uh, be more productive for me at the time that things come around. I'd be better served if I spent my time adjusting my plans or making new plans than freaking out about the fact that I'm fearful that they won't happen. Right. Now that once you, you get in the habit of doing these thoughts and, and it's like weightlifting, you might have that same thought tomorrow, even though we countered it just now and your counter might be totally different tomorrow, but you got to keep doing it till it's that thought disappears and it will disappear. And then eventually, and this usually takes months, but as you start doing the T forms daily, regularly and doing them well, you'll start to have what I call pinch me moments. And okay. that's, let's say one of your thing is, uh, let's say you're afraid of riding in elevators. I, you, I, I freak out when I ride in elevators. I can't ride elevators. And we counter those thoughts and we counter those thoughts. All, it, it, you're not going to get better on day one. You're still going to be afraid of the elevator, but you're going to be making these little things add up to big things. And all of a sudden, it's going to happen outside of your awareness. And this is the pinch me moment. You're going to be talking to someone and walking and you're going to get into an elevator and you're going to be start to get off the elevator and realize, oh, my God, I didn't even think about being on the elevator. Hmm. That's that's when it's taken hold and you've got the new pathway. And those things happen all the time. I mean, I've always freaked out when the market's done poorly. And I'm just like, like I told you a few minutes ago. I'm excited. I'm, I'm mad on the days it's going up now. Right. That's when most people are positioning themselves to make money, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, I want to stay with things you can do in the T form, but let me just do one digression here. Sure. Because we started with process and result oriented. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not doing this as a political speech. I like to stay apolitical, <laughs> but just look at the way Trump's dealing with things. His concern is re-election. So he wants to get the economy back as quick as he can to not hurt his chance of being re-elected. Mm -hmm. If he was a client of mine, I would say, no, you let the market crash if it crashes. I don't care. I mean, yeah, you do the things to help people with the trillion dollar bailout thing. I mean, that stuff I'm all for. But you know, he's trying to do things like with his Twitter or whatever, saying, oh, I, I want us to be back up and running by Easter to give everybody hope and confidence and stuff. 
you don't putting these timelines on a result oriented, not process oriented. I'd rather, you know, it'll work in the short term, but that's feeling better, not getting better. I'd rather say, hey, if we have to shut everything down and not even let people leave their house for two weeks, if that's what it takes and it'll only take two weeks, let's do that. Mm -hmm. Let's be let's find the process that works. Let's dedicate us and let's not stray from that. He keeps straying. We're going to do this. We're going to beat this thing. We're going to do a bailout. That's all fine. But then he can't say, oh, I want this to be done by Easter. Sure. It's not respecting the process. Yeah. That's goal oriented result, not goal, result oriented. And when you're result oriented, you rarely get the results you want. Here, look at it. And obviously, I'm no expert on the COVID thing or anything, but let's just take what we do now and say, let's say if we shut, if everybody stayed where they are right this minute for 14 days, it would get rid of it. Let's pretend that's how it works. Okay. If we do that, and let's say halfway through it, they find out you need 30 days. So we do it for 30, and it does, and it happens, and we're over it. Okay, the calendar is going to say May 1st, and his goal is to be reelected. You got a lot of time for the economy to re rebound and come back and get reelected if that's your goal anyway. Mm -hmm. You're going to be much better off than doing this roller coaster ride because, you know, when you're result oriented, you put yourself on a roller coaster you can't get off of. And, and that's not a good way to live, in my opinion. I mean, it, it's, it, it takes the control that you have and gives it away. Right. No, absolutely. And, and right now, like you said, you, everybody needs to focus on controlling the things that they can, can control, right? And starting yeah. small, um, whether it's, you know, the good habits they're trying to form, how they're spending their time. Like that really is the key, it would seem to me like, right, Sam? I mean, yeah. right now, there are a lot of things that's outside of people's control. And that's scary, right? That causes fear. And it's understandable. But at the same time, I think that if our listeners do the work and are thoughtful about how they're spending their time and maybe control a little bit more of their lives, then they'll feel better about the fact that they're in control of something versus having just completely lost it. And I know I've experienced that myself. You know, I, I, th I know that, you know, for a little bit there, you know, schedules were you know, not so, not, not so set, right. People are, aren't going into the office, right. Things are a little bit wishy-washy as far as who's working and who's not working. Right. Everybody was just trying to figure that out. And yeah. that was really the height of my anxiety, to be honest with you. But once I decided, you know what, this is what my process is going to be. Okay. Even though I'm working from home, I'm going to get dressed up every day as if, you know, th this were two months ago. Right. I'm going to go through my process in the same way as when the world was quote unquote normal. And I've noticed all the difference. I really have. Yeah. Well, that's like I say, what you've done, what you just, you, you know, eloquently exhibited was process protecting you. Process protects us. Result orientation puts us on that roller coaster ride. There's no stability. It's not smooth. But if you have a process, good things come out of that. You just it, it gives you a bait. It's like building a foundation. You've got something. You're grounded. It keeps you there, and that's what you just explained. That's how it's supposed to work. Right. You know, we we like to have these. You know, I always say, um, you know, missions help, expectations hurt. We put these expectations out there. And expectations never helped anyone. Very, Expectations yeah. are counterproductive. Right. You but see. if you have a mission to get better, that helps. That I mean, that leads you where you want to go. And the results that you wanted, those expectations will be exceeded most times. Not always, but most times. Mm -hmm. Very wise word. So for, for everybody listening, what I'll do is I'll make sure that you know, an example of the T forms is linked in the show notes so that everybody can um, work through this process should you um, choose to do so. But um, a few final questions here, Sam, if you if you have some more time. Yeah, I do. But I want to correct something you just did. OK, you know better than this, because I've told you this. You should it on yourself. Oh, man. 
We won't go into this today because it'll take too long, but the words you use color how you feel. And the worst word in the English language that I've tried to teach Sergio to eliminate is should. It's coercive language and nobody likes to be coerced. We won't go into it. If we talk again, we'll go into that. Oh, but you did just should should on me. We, it's we'll, a shitty way to live. It is a shitty way to live, and it's not an easy habit to break. But uh, we'll definitely sure. we'll, we'll definitely talk about this in part two. Uh, favorite books? I want to talk about books because you know people are sitting at home, and you know there's the, the people who listen to the show for the most part are people who want to continue to get better. Do you have any books that? you recommend that people take the time to to read at this point that may be helpful god there's so many good books that's such an open it know, is I, it's it's, I, it's a tough question but you know if you've if you've got one or two um we'd love to hear it yeah let me i, I gotta give that a moment's thought because the problem is books are a very individual thing because what i find is i mean i'm going to tell you a little story i my wife used to work for a company and I, I had zero respect for the CEO. Um, and it was so funny because I walked into his office. We went in on a weekend. I was with her and I, we, I walked into his office. And I think there's a company that as soon as you become a CEO, they sell you the books you're supposed to have on your bookshelf. <laughs> because I looked at his bookshelf and he had like 20 books up there, including most of the ones I would recommend to a CEO in general. And he practices not one thing that's in any of those books. Wow. Most people want to feel good or look good rather than be good. Right. And I see that around me all the time. And it's like these people read these books, but a lot of the times if the people don't know what they're looking for, when you recommend the book, they don't get the right message from it. They get the message the writer wanted you to get. And often I find the better message is underneath in the subtext of the messages they're giving. Sure. So yeah. that's, that, that's why I'm hesitant. I mean, there are a million good, but they're, you know, I, I tend to like more technical stuff and, and, you know, most people don't like that stuff. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it might be overwhelming. Um, you know, I like simple books to get you started, you know, like the one minute manager, um, mm -hmm. you know, is a great simple book. Um, another book just to open up your mind is, uh, uh, what's it called? It's, um, the Tao of Pooh. Okay. You know, very not straightforward. You know, most people want a book, you know, most people, I always joke that I could write the best diet book that's ever existed, but the only people that would buy it are my relatives and friends <laughs> because I won't put a title on it. Like they want you to put on it. They want three days to a slimmer you 30 days to the, the best perfect body. And I don't believe that's how it works. Mm -hmm. I believe it works in changing your habits and putting these habits in place that will then lead to the weight. And it's not, I can't put a time frame on that. Everybody wants, you know, the eat chocolate diet. Right. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Okay? It, it simply does not exist. Now, I mean, some of the books that I've come back to during this time are um, Atomic Habits by James Clear. Great book. Fantastic book. Okay. Definitely, uh, definitely recommend it to everybody. And it ties in well with what, uh, you know, what we've been talking about. And then the other book is Uncomfortable with Certainty. By Pima Chodron, which I have not uh, read that one, so I can't intelligently comment on it. You know, but both very, very poignant, very time. Um, you know, it's, it's it's definitely related to what we're going through right now. What about what about routines and habits? Do you have any routines and habits that uh, you go through every day? A ton of them. <laughs> well, we all do, I mean, but I'm saying, like, as far as in in terms of habits that you go through that are intended. To make you better. Everything I do is intended to do that. <laughs> okay, let's hear it. If you can, what does your morning look like? Um, I wake up. I do as many T forms as I need before I do anything else. Okay. I have a notepad next to my bed. I get out of bed and 
If I don't have to pee right away, I make my bed. Otherwise, I pee and then make my bed. Too much information. No, it's good. It's good. <laughs> um, then I go put on a kettle of hot water and my hydrogen water. And I drink a glass of hot water. Hot water, huh? Yeah. Wow. That's, okay. That's the first thing that hits my body every day. Um, then I do a quick check of my phone and maybe email, but make sure I don't get bogged down just to see if there's anything that's urgent. And there rarely is. And then I look to see what's on my schedule for the day, just to make sure I haven't forgotten something. Um, I'll come that that's upstairs and I'll go back downstairs and I'll do the back exercises that I told you about. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, depending on the day, usually my wife does the morning dog walk, but there are days that I'll do a dog walk and that'll supersede everything, but the, uh, everything that came after the water, if that happens. Okay. Um, but I feed the dog. So I'll feed the dog either right before or right after my back exercises, depending on if he's reminded me or not. And then I start my day. There you go. It's a good, that's a good routine. And I'm sure it's and, evolved over the years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, another thing, you know, that we won't get into here, but, uh, you know, one thing that was very, uh, transformational for my life. And if you talk to my wife, she'll tell you there was, she thought there was no way I could do it. And, um, you can't outperform your beliefs in yourself. And I got to tell you, I wasn't sure I could do it. And, you know, um, intermittent fasting or short window eating has become a staple of my life. And, um, for over three years now, food has not entered my body before 1 30 PM, um, West coast time. And I usually don't eat till three or four and I'm done eating anywhere from six to eight o'clock at night, depending when I started. Wow. And you know what? I mean, for, for, for some of the people listening, you know, I've done intermittent fasting as well, and it's not easy to do, but I think like a lot of the things that we've been talking about, Sam, you, you, like you said, you start small, right? It like yeah. gaining control is a step-by-step -step process, right? Mm -hmm. For the people who are listening, who have never, who don't have a morning habit or, or, uh, or a morning routine and don't have a lot of good habits, like you could probably not execute Sam's morning routine on a day-to-day -day basis, right? But you could add one thing, right? You could start small and then build on that. And I think that's from a process standpoint, like that's what life and getting better is all about. And peak performance is all about is starting small and little by little just building upon what it you know your successes from the past exactly the uh i never thought i could do like we could spend a whole session on the internet fasting but nobody ate more than i ate and ate later at night or all day long like i did so uh, there was reason for me to have doubt in my abilities and and i'll say it wasn't easy but it was easier than i thought it'd be as i slowly worked my hours down and it, it happened much quicker. Um, the health benefits that were promised uh, as far as my blood tests came, I, I was hitting the numbers they said would take a year to hit in three months, which blew me away. And I'm a skeptic. So like I had high glucose and I was every night for the last three weeks before I got my blood drawn, um, which was three months into it, uh, the last three weeks before the blood draw, I ate a haagen bar as the last thing I ate before I stopped eating every day. And I was eating cheeseburgers and corn dogs and crappy food because I really wanted to, t I like to put things to the test. I'm a cynical guy, mm -hmm. but it, it blew me away. It, it exceeded all my expectations. Amazing. You know, I gave away the first thing I teach. I don't care if you're a CEO or a 13 year old kid. The first assignment I give most all my clients is, Make your bed first thing in the morning. Sure. And you'll be, a, it, it's self serving on one level because a couple months in, they'll realize that they're not even thinking about it. It's become a habit and it's part of who they are. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I make my bed in hotel rooms or 
wherever I am every day. I just, I can't not do it. And it doesn't take any thought or, and I just remember how much I hated it the first week or two. And most of my clients experience that same thing, but it's self-serving because it's an easy way for me to show you something you hate and don't think is going to be any good for you very quickly becomes who you are and you can't outperform your self image. Absolutely. And this is, uh, and, and one of the things I do is uh, uh, I end my showers with a minute and a half worth of cold water. And now you and I, I, you're, I agree with what you're doing, but you don't need to do a minute and a half. You'll get the same benefit from 10 seconds. I tell my clients to do that as well. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll dive into that in the next episode. But again, something that I hate to do, but it's intended to you know, really just fortify my brain and what it is that I'm trying to do, right? I'm in it, control. As you well know, and it energizes you. I mean, you sure it, it changes your attitude about, you know, when you get out of a hot, relaxing shower, you're a little lethargic most days, but you you could have that hot, lethargic shower and then switch to the other. And it's so invigorating and so predict productivity boosting. Right. For me, it's about, you know what, whether you like it or not, we're doing this thing today. This is all everything that you, whether you like it or not, what's on your to-do list, all of your positive habits, this, this is all happening. So buckle up. Well, can I give you a piece of advice? Please. <laughs> you know, remember how I said the way you talk to yourself is key and, and how, the words you use and everything? Sure. You know, we're used to always having to get on ourselves to do things, mm -hmm. making ourselves. I don't care how hard it is. I'm going to do this. You know, being nice to ourselves is much more productive. You know, instead of saying, I don't care, just say, hey, this is part of my process. And that's why I'm doing it. Instead of I don't care how much I hate it. Make it about you and your process. This is what part of my process. And that's why I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Because. So as soon as you say, I don't care how hard is it, you, your resistance, your body tightens up and you have resistance more than you need. Part of my, uh, part of a lifelong struggle that I'm certainly working on. <laughs> You're probably resistant to me saying that to you. I, I very well might be, but uh, <laughs> That's Sam, human. appreciate, uh, really appreciate all the time. Uh, you, you know, I know that, uh, your time is super valuable and you're, you're, You've got some other people that you need to talk to, but um, let's start off with where can people find you online? Well, you know, I, I try and hide for the most part. Um, I wrote a book on overcoming anxiety and depression. It has the T form in it and it explains it in a little more detail and it gives examples about some of the first thoughts you'll have about the T form itself in them. And that book's called Been There, Done That to Do That, Do This. Sorry, Been There, Done That, Do This. Need some editing there. And uh, you can find that at www.tao, the number three, dot com, tao3.com. And um, I have a website that's designed for, for my peak performance coaching. And that is at www.super, S U P E R, T A O again dot coms s u p e r t a o dot com and that's a site uh that has a blog on it called the mindside blog i tend to update it about once a month mm -hmm. um a lot of the topics have sports related themes but i believe the stuff that is in them it's it's all about learning to use your brain and and change the way you think about things no matter what the title is I would assume that if you read most of them, you'll get something out of them. Um, they're very short. Uh, they usually focus on one or two topics at most. And like I said, even though they might have a sports theme, there are also business themed ones, parenting themed ones. Sure. Um, and everything in between. Um, one thing I do like is when people send me suggestions for something they're dealing with because I like a challenge and, and it makes me better. So feel free to send my assistant uh, those. I'm on Twitter. I'm not very active. I usually post my blog and I post a quote once a week. And that's pretty much the extent of my Twittering. 
Uh, and that's uh, at Super Tau Inc. on Twitter. And that's pretty much the only ways you're going to find me. Um, if you really need to get a hold of me, I and you know Sergio, call him because he knows how to reach me. There you go. And I'll make sure that there's links in the show notes to all this good stuff. Um, finally, do you have any requests or asks for the audience? Um, challenge yourself, you know, don't, don't be afraid to be different, you know, uh, do things that get you out of your comfort zone, you know, as often as you get the chance and be ready for people to make fun of you. I mean, people make fun of a lot of the stuff I do and, you know, I, you got to get through that. Don't take, I guess my best advice to everyone is learn not to take things personally. You know, most people take things personally and it makes life so much harder. You know, it makes it hard to be productive. It's easy to go from taking something as, oh, that's interesting and making it useful to you than taking an offense to it. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of things about me that I still need to change. But if somebody doesn't point it out to me, you know, it's ideal when they point it out in a nice way as a suggestion. But, you know, even if they say, God, you're an idiot for doing that. Why don't you do this? You know, I, I probably won't take to it in the moment they said it. But I guarantee you when I walk away, it'll hit me and my subconscious will work on it. And I'll be thanking them later, even though I probably didn't react well in that moment. Very wise advice. Sam, so, thanks again. Uh, or go ahead. Go ahead. One last thing on the person that. The, because I said, don't take things personally, but it's, it's, I always like to give an example of how not to please. And the, and, and the way that is, is if you learn to accept that things, bad things always happen to everyone and don't take it as a reflection on you, take it as, Oh, wow, that happened. Now, what am I going to do? That's how you turn that old habit of personalization into a, a pro product of growth. Love it. It was fantastic advice. Thanks again, Sam. Appreciate your time. And we will 100% be doing a part two if you're up to it. I would like that. Thanks again. All right. Good talking to you, Sergio. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed and learned a lot from my conversation with Mr. Sam Obitz. You can find the show notes for everything we discussed at sportsbusinessclassroom.com forward slash Sam dash Obits. And ladies and gentlemen, if you learned something from this episode, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, and anyone you think might be able to get something out of it. And if you really got a lot of value, I'd really appreciate it if you take a few minutes to review the show on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. And as always, we want to hear from you. We do the show for you. So if you have any follow-up questions for Sam or myself, you can leave a comment on the site or send us your questions on social media by tagging us at Sports Business Classroom or at Super Tau Inc. on Twitter. Big thank you to our sponsor, Sports Business Classroom Online and Hall Pass Media. And thanks again for listening. Stay safe out there, guys. We will see you here next week on the Sports Business Classroom audio experience.